So let me start. Um, as you know, my, my, the topic of my paper is uh, centered around the Danish cartoon affair, and I hope you'll have a chance of uh, some good question and answers and intensive exchanges following it. Any academic discussion of religion in the present moment must countenance the shrill polemics that have become the hallmark of the subject today. The events of the past decade, including 9-11, the subsequent war on terror, and the rise of religious politics globally, have intensified what was at one point a latent schism between religious and secular worldviews. Writers from both sides of the schism now posit an incommensurable divide between strong religious beliefs and secular values. Indeed, a series of international events, particularly around Islam, are often seen as further evidence of this incommensurability. Despite this polarization, some reflected voices in the current debate have tried to show how the religious and the secular are not so much immutable essences or opposed ideologies, as they are concepts that gain a particular salience with the emergence of the modern state and attendant politics. Concepts that are furthermore interdependent and necessarily linked in their mutual transformation and historical emergence. Viewed from this perspective, as a secular rationality has come to define law, statecraft, knowledge production, and economic relations in the modern world, it has also simultaneously transformed the conceptions, ideals, practices, and institutions of religious life. Secularism here is understood not simply as the doctrinal separation of the church from the state, but the rearticulation of religion in a manner that is commensurate with modern sensibilities and modes of governance. To rethink the religious is to also rethink the secular and its truth claims, its promise of internal and external goods. In other words, what I'm taking for granted here as a point of departure is what seems to be the consensus in much of the emergent scholarship on secularism, that secularism cannot simply be understood as a separation of church and state, but secularism has always involved states re formation of religious life and its institutions and practices. So, and what that entails is not simply an issue of the law, but also the cultural practices, uh, the larger social life of what is considered to be religious and therefore distinct, norm normatively distinct from the apparatus of the state. But in fact, when you begin to look at the history of the transformations that the modern state has brought, brought about, what you see is it's its constant adjudication reformation, reform of, of religious life. So that's the analytical point from which we are starting here. <clears throat> now these analytical reflections on secularism are often challenged by those who fear that this manner of thinking forestalls effective action against the threat of religious extremism that haunts our world today. By historicizing the truth of secular reason and questioning its normative claims, one paves the way for religious fanaticism to take hold of our institutions and society. Our temporal frame of action requires certainty and judgment rather than critical thinking of secular goods. Now, public reaction on the part of both Muslims and non-Muslims to the publication of Danish cartoons of Muhammad, which were initially, as you know, published in 2005 and then republished in 2008, is a conspicuous example of what, for many, is at stake in the standoff between religious and secular worldviews, particularly in liberal democratic societies. Following the initial publication of the cartoons, while shrill and incendiary polemics were common to both sides, most commentators concurred that what was at stake was a moral impasse between a religious taboo and the secular liberal principle uh, freedom of expression, especially satirical expression, so essential to a liberal democratic society. While this consensus con continues to reign supreme, in this talk today I want to unsettle this way of thinking, calling our attention uh, instead to the normative conceptions enfolded within this assessment about what constitutes religion and a modern religious subject in our world. I hope to show that to abide by the description that the Danish cartoons exemplifying a clash between the principles of blasphemy and freedom of speech is to accept a prior set of judgments about what kind of injury or offense the cartoons caused and how such an injury might be addressed 
in a liberal democratic society. At stake, I want to argue, is how one describes or defines religious extremism and the acts and events that are understood to exemplify it. As I will show, descriptions of religious fanaticism or extremism often enfold a set of judgments and affiliations such that to abide by a certain description is also to uphold these judgments. These descriptions are often not only reductive of the events they purport to describe, but more importantly, they are premised on normative conceptions of the subject, religion, language, and law that are far more fraught than the call for decisive political action allows. I want to cleave apart description from judgment in contemporary discourse on religious fanaticism so as to show how the practice of reading, critique, and judgment itself would change if we were to unpack all that we are being called upon to sign on to, including a series of epistemological and ontological commitments whose status is far from resolved in both academic and popular discourse. As I suggested earlier, Despite the volume of commentary produced on the Danish cartoons, there were two stable poles around which much of the debate coalesced. On the one hand were those who claimed that Muslim outcry had to be disciplined and subjected to protocols of freedom of speech, characteristic of liberal democratic societies, in which no figure or object, no matter how sacred, might be depicted, caricatured, or satirized. Critics of this position, on the other hand, claim that freedom of speech has never simply been a matter of the exercise of rights, but entails civic responsibility, especially in hybrid, multicultural, and religiously plural societies. These critics charge that <coughs> European governments employ a double standard when it comes to the treatment of Muslims, since desecration of Christian symbols is not only regulated by blasphemy laws in countries like Britain, Austria, Italy, Spain, and Germany, but that the media often makes allowances to accommodate Judeo-Christian sensitivities. For some, this was reminiscent of the anti-Semitic propaganda leveled at another minority in European history that was also at one time portrayed as a drain on Europe's land and resources. But for many liberals and progressives critical of the Islamophobia sweeping contemporary Europe, Muslim furor over the cartoons posed a particular set of problems. While they could see in these images the lurking racism behind these cartoons, it was the religious dimension of the Muslim protest that remained troubling. Thus, even when there was recognition that Muslim religious sensibilities were not properly accommodated in Europe, there was nonetheless an inability to understand the sense of injury expressed by so many Muslims. The British cultural and political critic Tariq Ali exemplified this position in a column he wrote from the London Review of Books. Dismissing the claim that Muhammad's pictorial depiction constitutes blasphemy in Islam, Tariq Ali went on to ridicule the anguish expressed by many Muslims on seeing or hearing about these images, and I quote from him. As for religious pain, this is mercifully an experience denied unbelievers like myself and felt only by divines from various faiths who transmit it to their followers or by politicians in direct contact with the Holy Spirit, Bush, Blair and Ahmadinejad, and of course the Pope and the Grand Ayatollah. End of quote. Classic Tariq Ali, right? Uh, in Tariq Ali's view, Muslims who express pain upon seeing the Prophet depicted as a terrorist or hearing about such depictions were nothing but pawns in the hands of religious and political leaders. Similarly, Stanley Fish in an op-ed piece, piece for the New York Times opined that the cartoon affair was best understood in terms of a contrast between their strongly held religious beliefs and our anemic liberal morality. Liberal morality, he argued, consists in a withdrawal from morality in any strong insisted form, such that liberals do not care whether their beliefs prevail or not. Muslims, on the other hand, he argued, have strong beliefs whose implementation they passionately defend. I want to argue that to understand the affront the cartoons caused within terms of racism alone, or for that matter, Western irreligiosity, is to circumscribe ourselves to the limited vocabulary of blasphemy and freedom of speech. Both these notions, grounded in juridical notions of rights and state sanction, presuppose a semiotic ideology in which signifiers are arbitrarily linked to concepts, their meaning open to people's reading 
in accord with the particular code they share between them. What might appear to be a symbol of mirth and merrymaking to some may well be interpreted as blasphemous by others. In what follows, I want to suggest that this rather impoverished understanding of images, icons, and signs not only naturalizes a certain concept of a religious subject ensconced in a world of encoded meaning, but also fails to attend to the affective and embodied practices through which a subject comes to relate to a particular sign, a relation founded not only on representation, but what I will call attachment and cohabitation. I want to clarify at the outset, and this is a point on which I'm repeatedly misunderstood, so I hope this is clear to you, that my goal here is not, and I repeat, not to provide a more authoritative model for understanding Muslim anger over the cartoons. So it's not a cause and effect argument about what really transpired, why did Muslims protest. This is not what this paper is about. Indeed, the motivations for the international protests were notoriously heterogeneous, and it is impossible to explain them through a single causal narrative. And there is much very persuasive literature that has been written precisely in explaining what in different contexts caused the demonstrations to happen, happen in various parts of the Muslim world, and what in effect were the causes in the backlash against Muslims within Europe uh, for their protest against the cartoons. Um, instead, my aim in pers pursuing this line of thought in this paper is to push us to consider why such little thought has been given in academic and public debate about what constitutes moral injury in our secular world today. What are the conditions of intelligibility that render certain moral claims legible and others mute? Where the language of street violence can be mapped onto the matrix of racism, blasphemy, and free speech, but the claim to what Tariq Ali pejoratively calls religious pain remains elusive, if not incomprehensible. What are the costs entailed in turning to the law or the state to settle such a controversy? How might we draw on the recent scholarship on secularism to complicate what is otherwise a polemical and shrill debate about the proper place of religious symbols in a secular democratic society? So these are the questions that orient my paper. W.J.T. Mitchell, in his book, What Do Pictures Want?, argues that we need to reckon with images not just as inert objects, but as animated beings that exert a certain force in this world. Mitchell emphasizes that this force not be reduced to interpretation, but taken up as a relationship that binds the image to the spectator, object to subject, a relationship that is transformative of the social context in which it unfolds. He argues, and I quote, the complex field of visual reciprocity is not merely a byproduct of social reality, but actively constitutive of it. Vision is as important as language in mediating social relations, and it is not reducible to language or sign or to discourse. Pictures want equal rights with language, not to be turned into language." End of quote. Despite such admonitions, the idea that the primary function of images, icons, and signs is to communicate meaning, regardless of the structure of relationality in which the object and subject reside, is widely upheld. Webb Keen, in his recent book, Christian Moderns, traces the imbricated genealogy of this understanding of semiotic forms and the modern concept of religion. Keen follows a number of other scholars in pointing out that the modern concept of religion, as a set of propositions, in, as, a, as a set of propositions in, in a set of beliefs to which the individual gives, gives assent, owes its emergence to the rise of Protestant Christianity and its subsequent globalization. Whereas colonial missionary movements were the carriers for many of the practical and doctrinal elements of the semiotic ideology, aspects of it became embedded in more secular ideas of what it means to be modern. One crucial aspect of the semiotic ideology is the distinction between subject and object, between substance and meaning, signifiers and signified, form and essence. Unclued from its initial moorings in doctrinal and theological concerns, these set of distinctions have become a part of modern folk understanding of how images and words operate in the world. One version of this is evident in Saussure's model of language that posits an immutable distinction between the realm of language and the realm of things, material or conceptual. 
between the sign and the world, between speech and linguistic system. Historians and anthropologists have long written about the shock experienced by proselytizing missionaries when they first encountered non-Christian natives who attributed divine agency to material signs. Often regarded material objects and their exchange as an ontological extension of themselves, thereby dissolving the distinction between persons and things, and for whom linguistic practices did not simply denote reality, but also helped create it as in the use of ritual speech to invoke ancestral spirits or divine presence. The dismay that Protestant Christian missionaries felt at the moral consequences that followed from native epistemological assumptions, I want to suggest, has many resonances with the bafflement many liberals and progressives express at the scope and depth of Muslim reaction over the cartoons today. One source of bafflement emanates from the semiotic ideology that underpins their sense that religious symbols and icons are one thing, and sacred figures with all the devotional respect they might evoke another. To confuse one with the other is to commit a category mistake, and to fail to realize that signs and symbols are only arbitrarily linked to the abstractions that humans have come to revere and regard as sacred. As, many, as any modern sensible human being must understand, religious signs, such as the cross, are not embodiments of the divine, but only stand in for the divine through an act of human encoding and interpretation. On this reading, Muslims agitating over the cartoons exhibit an improper reading practice, collapsing the necessary distinction between the subject, which is the divine status attributed to Muhammad, with the object, pictorial depictions of Muhammad. Their agitation, in other words, is a product of a fundamental confusion about the materiality of a particular semiotic form that is only arbitrarily, not necessarily, linked to the abstract character of their religious beliefs. A critical piece of this semiotic ideology entails the notion that in so much as religion is primarily about belief in a set of propositions to which one lends one's assent, it is fundamentally a matter of choice. Once the truth of such a conception of religion and concomitant subjectivity is conceded, then it follows that wrong-headed natives and Muslims can perhaps be persuaded to adopt a different reading practice, one in which images, icons, and signs do not have any spiritual consequences in and of themselves, but are only ascribed such a status through a set of human conventions. <coughs> The transformative power of this vision was precisely what motivated the 18th and 19th century missionaries to undertake the pedagogical project of teaching native subjects to properly distinguish between inanimate objects, humans, and divinity. It is this same vision that seems to inform the well-meaning pleas circulating in Europe today for Muslims to stop taking the Danish cartoon so seriously. To realize that the image of Muhammad can produce no real injury, given its true locus, is in the interiority of the, of the individual believer and not the fickle world of material symbols and signs. The hope that a correct reading practice can yield compliant subjects crucially depends, in other words, upon a prior agreement about what religion should be in the modern world. It is this normative understanding of religion internal to liberalism that is often missed and glossed over by commentators such as Stanley Fish, who I mentioned earlier, when he claims that liberalism is anemic in its moral and religious commitment. <coughs> I want to turn now to a different understanding of icons that was not only operative among Muslims who felt offended by the cartoons, but has a long and rich history within different traditions, including Christianity and ancient <coughs> Greek thought. At the time of the initial publication of the cartoons, I was struck by the sense of personal loss expressed by many devout Muslims on hearing about or seeing the cartoons. While many of those I interviewed condemned the violent demonstrations, they nonetheless expressed a sense of grief and sorrow. As one young British Muslim put it, and I quote, I do not like what those raiding crowds did in burning down buildings and cars at places like Nigeria and Gaza. But what really upset me is the absolute lack of understanding on the part of my secular friends who are, by the way, not all white, many are from Pakistan and Bangladesh, at how upset people like myself felt on seeing the Prophet insulted in this way. It felt like it was a personal insult, 
The idea that we should just get over this hurt makes me so mad. If they don't feel offended by how Jesus is presented, and some do of course, why do they expect that all of us should feel the same? The prophet is not after all Mel Gibson or Brad Pitt, he is the prophet. The relationship of intimacy with the prophet expressed here has been explicitly thematized in Islamic devotional literature on Muhammad and his immediate family, the Ahl al-Bayt. In this literature, Muhammad is regarded as a moral exemplar, whose words and deeds are understood not so much as commandments, but as ways of inhabiting the world bodily and ethically. Those who profess love for the prophet do not simply follow his advice and admonitions to the ummah, that exist in the form of the hadith, which is the compendium of the prophet's sayings and deeds, but also trying to emulate how he dressed, what he ate, how he spoke to his friends and adversaries, how he slept, talked, walked, and so on. These mimetic ways of realizing the prophet's behavior are lived not as commandments, but as virtues, where one, want, where one wants to ingest, as it were, in oneself the prophet's persona. The point I wish to emphasize here is that within traditions of Muslim piety, a devout Muslim's relationship to Muhammad is predicated not so much upon a communicative or representational model, but an assimilative one. Muhammad in this understanding is not simply a proper noun referring to a particular historical figure, but marks a relation of similitude. In this economy of signification, he's a figure of eminence in his constant exemplariness and is therefore not a referential sign that stands apart from an essence that it denotes. The modality of attachment that I'm describing here between a devout Muslim and the exemplary figure of Muhammad is perhaps best captured in, Arist in Aristotle's notion of skesis, used to describe different kinds of relations in his work categories, a concept that was later elaborated by the Neoplatonists such as Porphyry, Ammonius, and Elias. The Oxford English Dictionary describes skesis as the manner in which a thing is related to something else. <clears throat> Scholars commenting on Aristotle's use of skesis distinguish it from his use of the term prosty, in which skesis captures a sense of embodied habitation and intimate proximity that imbues a relation. Its closest cognate in Greek is hexes, and in Latin habitus, both suggesting a bodily condition or temperament that undergirds a particular modality of relation. Particularly relevant to my argument here is, is the meaning Skesis was given during the second iconoclastic controversy, when perhaps, not surprisingly, it is the iconophiles who used it to re respond against charges of idolatry and to defend their doctrine of consubstantiality. I understand I'm speaking in the land of Calvin, so this might... <laughs> make it difficult for this argument to carry over. Kenneth, Kenneth Perry, in his book on Byzant uh, Byzantine iconophile thought, shows that Aristotle's concept of relationality became crucial to, to the defense of the holy image by the two great iconophiles, Theodore of Studite and the patriarch Nikephoros. Perry shows what the image and prototype share in their discourse is not in essence, this is crucial, human or divine, but the relationship between them. This relationship is based in homonymy and hypostasis. The image and deity are two in nature and essence, but identical in name. It is the imaginal structure shared between them that gives form to this relationship. That is to say, to be the image of is to be in a living relation to. Skesis aptly captures not only how a devout Muslim's relationship to Muhammad is described in Islamic devotional literature, but also how it is lived and practiced in various parts of the Muslim world. Even the thoroughly standardized canon of the Sunnah, which is the authoritative record of the Prophet's actions and speech, vacillates between what read like straightforward commands on the one hand and descriptions of the Prophet's behavior on the other, his persona and habits, understood as exemplars for the constitution of one's own ethical and affective equipment. For many pious Muslims, it is these embodied practices and virtues that provide the substrate through which one comes to acquire a devoted and pious disposition. It is not due to the compulsion of the law that one emulates the Prophet's conduct, but because of the ethical capacities one has developed that incline one to behave in a certain way. For many Muslims, the offense the cartoons committed was not against a moral interdiction, thou shalt not make images of Muhammad, 
but against a structure of affect, a habitus that feels wounded. This wound requires moral action, but its language is neither juridical nor that of street protest because it does not belong to an economy of blame, accountability, and reparations. The action it requires is internal to the structure of affect, relations and virtues that predisposes one to experience and act as a violation in the first place. One might ask what happens to this mode of injury when it is subject to the language of law, politics, and street protest, to the language of identity politics. What are its conditions of intelligibility in a world where identity politics reign and the juridical language of rights dominate? Does it remain mute and unintelligible, or does its logic undergo a transformation? How does this kind of religious offense complicate principles of free speech and freedom of religion espoused by liberal democratic societies? Let me briefly provide some ways of thinking about these questions. Notably, some European Muslims, outraged by the lack of response on the part of the Danish government and the persistent republication of the images, have sought redress in recent precedents set by the European Court of Human Rights. Two recent decisions of European Court are of relevance here. The Otto Preminger Institute versus Austria ruling in 1994 and the Wingrove versus United Kingdom judgment in 1997, both of which banned the display and circulation of two films for offending devout Christians. These decisions notably did not ground their judgment in European blasphemy laws, but in Article 10 of the European Convention of Human Rights that ensures the right to freedom of expression. You might ask, how is it that the article that ensures the right to freedom of expression then permits uh, the legal confiscation of these two films from circulation? While Article 10, which ensure, the article that ensures the right to freedom of expression of the European Convention holds freedom of expression to be an absolute right, the second clause of the same article allows for this right to be limited if the restrictions are prescribed by law and are understood to be necessary to, the, to public order and the functioning of a democratic society. It is important to note that this regulated conception of freedom of expression in Europe stands in sharp contrast with the more libertarian conception of free speech in the United States. Most European countries coming out of the experience of the Holocaust and the Second World War place strong restrictions on forms of speech that might foster racial hatred and lead to violence. At stake in the Otto Preminger case was a film produced by the nonprofit, the Otto Preminger Institute, which portrayed Jesus, God, and Mary in ways that were offensive to Christian sensibilities. Under Section 188 of the Austrian Penal Code, the film was seized before it was shown and forfeited. The filmmaker appealed the case to the European Court, which ruled in favor of the Austrian government and did not find the Austrian government in violation of Article 10 of the European Convention. The Austrian government had defended the seizure of the film on grounds that it would be perceived as an attack on the Christian religion, especially Roman Catholicism. And it argued that the role of religion in everyday life of the, prophet of the village of Tyrol, where the film was to be shown, was considerable. The pro proportion of Roman Catholic believers, the Austrian government argued, among Austrian population as a whole was already considerable, 78%. Among Tylorians, it was as high as 87%. Consequently, the government argued, and I quote, there is a pressing social need for the preservation of religious peace. It is necessary to protect public order against the film, end of quote. When the decision of the Austrian government was challenged in the European Court of Human Rights, the court concurred with this judgment and argued, and I quote, the court cannot disregard the fact that the Roman Catholic religion is the religion of the overwhelming majority of the Tylorians. In seizing the film, the Austrian authorities acted to ensure religious peace in that region and to prevent that some people should feel the object of attacks on their religious beliefs in an unwarranted and offensive manner. In the quote. A similar regard for Christian religious sensibilities informed the European court's decision in the Wingrove versus United Kingdom case when the court upheld the British government's refusal to permit circulation of a film found to be offensive to Christian sensibilities. The European court made clear that while it found the British blasphemy laws objectionable, 
In other words, it didn't ground its, its, uh, uh, its withholding of the film and the blasphemy laws of Britain. But it supported the decision of, of the government on the basis of the state's margin of appreciation for permissible restrictions operative in Article 10, ensuring freedom of expression in the European Convention. The court upheld the government's decision to withhold circulation of the film because it had a legitimate aim to, uh, to, to, uh, to protect the rights of others and to protect against seriously offensive attacks on matters regarded as sacred by Christians. Now, while these decisions of the European Court have been criticized for accommodated, accommodating religious feelings at the cost of free speech, I would like to draw our attention to a different issue, namely the margin of appreciation accorded to the state in determining when and how free speech may be limited. The second clause of the article of Article 10 of the European Convention on Free Speech, which by the way mirrors Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, gives the state a wide margin of appreciation to limit free speech if the state deems it to pose a threat to national security, and this is a direct quote from the article, national security, territorial integrity, public safety, health and morals of a society, or reputations and rights of others, end of quote. In commenting about the centrality of the legal concept of public order in this uh, French legal tradition, Hussein, the anthropologist Hussein Agrima argues that it is part of a broader semantic and conceptual field in which notions of public health and morals and national security are interlinked. And this is important, the referent almost always seems to be the majority religious culture. A fundamental contradiction haunts liberal democratic legal traditions, he argues. On the one hand, everyone is equal before the law. And on the other hand, the aim of the law is to create and maintain public order, an aim that necessarily turns upon the concerns and attitudes of its majority population. While some European Muslims see the European court's judgments as blatantly hypocritical, they accommodate Christian sensitivities but ignore Muslim ones. I would like to point out that regardless of the social context, when this legal reasoning is used, it tends to privilege the cultural and religious beliefs of the majority population. A number of observers of the European court have noted, for example, that there appears to be a bias in the jurisprudence of the court toward protecting traditional and established religions and a corresponding insensitivity towards the rights of minority, non-traditional, or unpopular religious groups. Those religions established within a state, either because they are an official religion, as in the case of the Anglican Church, or have a large number of adherents, as it was the case in, uh, in Austria and Britain, uh, are more likely to have their core doctrines recognized as manifestations of religious belief. It is not surprising, therefore, that when the majority religion was Islam, as was the case in, uh, in this famous case, IA versus Turkey in 2005, the European court ruling was consistent with the reasoning used in the Otto Preminger and the Wingrove decisions. The court upheld the Turkish government's ban on a book deemed offensive to the majority Muslim population on the basis that it violated the rights of others who were offended by its profaneness. As such, the Turkish government's decision had met a pressing social need and was not in violation of Article 10 of the European Convention of Human Rights. Now, the European Court is not the only legal institution where state concern for security and public and moral order leads to the accommodation of majority religious traditions. <laughs> Consider, for example, the much publicized apostasy trial of Nasser Hamad Abu Zayd in Egypt, who is, of course, a faculty member at the University of Leiden now. Uh, in Utrecht, is he now in Utrecht? Wow. He's well, what do you know? <laughs> Distinguished God. So, um, <laughs> Abu Zayn was tried for the crime of apostasy on the basis of his academic published writings. The case was introduced and tried based on a religious principle called hisbah that did not exist in modern Egyptian legal codes before, but was adopted in the litigation process to declare Abu Zayn an apostate. Mind you, the principle of Hezbah existed historically in classical Sharia, but the form it took in the Abu Zayd case differed dramatically in that it came to be articulated within the concept of public order and the state's duty to uphold the morals of the society in congruence with the Islamic tradition of the majority. 
The language used in the Abu Zaid case bears striking similarities with invocations of public order and the European Court of Human Rights decisions that I cited earlier. Despite the different sociopolitical contexts, what is shared between the Egyptian legal argument and those of the European Court is the French legal tradition's concern for public order and by extension the laws privileging of majority religious sensibilities. It might be argued in response that the Otto Preminger and the Abu Zaid cases abrogate the secular principle of state neutrality by accommodating the sensitivities of a religious tradition. But such an objection, I would suggest, is based on an erroneous understanding of liberal secularism as abstaining from the domain of religious life. And this is the point with which I've opened my talk. As much of recent scholarship suggests, contrary to the ideological self-understanding of secularism as the doctrinal separation of religion and state, secularism has historically entailed the regulation and reformation of religious beliefs, doctrines, and practices to yield a particular normative conception of religion that is largely Protestant Christian in its contours. Historically speaking, the secular state has not simply cordoned off religion from its regulatory ambitions, but, to sought, but sought to remake it through the agency of the law. This remaking is shot through with tensions and paradoxes that cannot simply be attributed to the intransigency of religionists, Muslims or Christians. One particular tension is manifest in how freedom of religion often conflicts with the principle of freedom of speech, both of which are upheld by secular liberal democratic societies. As might be clear to, to, to my audience here, the contradictions that I've discussed here are not simply the result of the machinations of opportunistic religious extremists or an ineffective secular state, but are at the heart of the legal and cultural organization of secular societies. To attend to these contradictions is to admit to the shifting nature of secularism itself and the problems it historically manifests. A second plausible option that is open for European Muslims is Europe's hate speech laws. Laws that following the experience of Nazi Germany prohibit the use of anti-Semitic and racist speech acts that might provoke an insight racial or ethnic hatred. Many European Muslims have come to argue that the cartoons are a particularly vicious example of the racism they have come to experience from their compatriots in Europe. As one prominent advocate of this position, the British sociologist Tarek Madhud put it, the cartoons are not just about one individual Muslim per se, just as cartoons about Moses as a crooked financier would not be about one man, but a comment on Jews. And just as the latter would be racist, so are the cartoons in question. Madhud argues that racism is not simply about biology, but can be directed at culturally and religiously marked groups. Once we move away from a biological notion of race, he argues it is, it is possible to see that Muslims can also be the victims of racism qua Muslims, as well as qua Asian or Arabs or Bosnians. Indeed, that these different kinds of racisms can interact and can mutate and new forms of racism can indeed emerge. This is to recognize that a form of racism has emerged which connects with but goes beyond a critique of Islam as a religion." End of quote. The European majority fears that to give claims such as, Madhud's legal, uh, such as Madhud's legal force will open the doors for Muslims to use European anti-hate speech laws to unduly regulate forms of speech that they regard as injurious to their religious sensibilities. Many Europeans who champion freedom of speech reject the claim that the Danish cartoons have anything to do with racism or Islamophobia, arguing instead that Muslim extremists are using this language for their own nefarious purposes. A number of legal critics, for example, charge that Muslim use of European hate speech laws is a ruse by opponents of liberal values who understand that in order to be admitted into the democratic debate, they have to use a rhetoric that hides the conflict between their ideas and the basic tenets of open societies. Such voices caution soft-hearted liberals and multiculturalists not to fall for such an opportunistic misuse of anti-discrimination and human rights discourse because, they warn ominously, it will lead to the enforcement of Islamic values and the ultimate destruction of the Europe of the Enlightenment. And I'm often liberally quoting from these commentators when I give you these sentences. This rejection of Muslim invocations of hate speech laws turns upon two arguments. One, religious identity is categorically different from racial identity. 
and two, lack of evidence of racial discrimination against Muslims in European societies. In regard to the first, that ra racial and religious identity are fundamentally distinct, these critics argue that race is an immutable biological characteristic, whereas religion is a matter of choice. One can change one's religion, but not one's skin color. Danish cartoons, on the other hand, merely offend religious belief. According to the le legal critic Guy Harsher, in so much as racist, which who I'm told teaches at the Free University in, in Belgium, I believe, in so much as racist behavior refuses to grant equal status to Jews and blacks because of the perceived biologically inferior character, it violates the liberal principle of equality. Blasphemy, on the other hand, he says, is normal and may be a cathartic value in open societies. What I want to problematize here is the presumption that religion is ultimately a matter of choice. Such a judgment is predicated on a prior notion, one that I mentioned earlier, that religion is ultimately about belief in a set of propositions to which one gives one's assent. Once this premise is granted, then it is easy to assert that one can change one's belief just as easily as one might change one's dietary preferences or one's name. While the problematic conception of race as a biological attribute might be apparent to the audience, and I hope it's apparent to you, because much of legal, uh, I mean, race theory is precisely complicated, this idea that race is biological, the normative conception of religion offered here encounters few challenges. Earlier I explicated the concomitant semiotic ideology this conception encodes. Here I want to draw out the implications of this concept when encoded within the law. <coughs> the legal critics I cite here do not simply misrecognize the kind of religiosity at stake in Muslim reactions to Danish cartoons, but they also echo the presumptions of the civil law tradition in which the epistemological status of religious belief has come to be cast as speculative and therefore less real than the materiality of race and biology. Notably, in the arguments I've quoted here, the normative conception of religion as belief facilitates other claims about what counts as evidence, materiality, and real versus psychic or imagined harm. In a thoughtful article entitled The Limits of Toleration, politi uh, political theorist Kirsty McClure shows how the idea that religion is primarily about private belief is closely tied to the historical emergence of the notion of worldly harm in 18th century. When the modern state came to extend its jurisdiction over a range of bodily practices, both religious and non-religious, which were deemed pertinent to the smooth functioning of the newly emergent civic domain. As a result, a variety of religious rituals and practices, such as animal sacrifice, had to be made inconsequential to religious doctrine in order to bring them under the purview of the law. This in turn depended upon securing a new epistemological basis for religion and its various doctrinal claims on subjects, space, and time. McClure shows, for example, that the argument for religious toleration in John Locke's A Letter Concerning Toleration is grounded in an empiricist epistemology that empowers the state as the sole legitimate adjudicator of worldly practice. The boundaries of toleration, she argues, come to be civilly defined by the empirical determination of whether particular acts and practices are demonstrably injurious to the safety and security of the state or the civil interests of its citizens, with these latter defined in equally empirical terms." End of quote. McClure's argument draws attention to the ways in which the emergence of the modern concept of religion is intrinsically tied to the problem of governance and statecraft. In the debate about Danish cartoons, the limits of toleration were quickly set by concerns for the safety and security of the state. The Muslim charge that cartoons were racist was often dismissed as nothing but an expression of fundamentalist Islam. And it was not long before Muslim criticisms of the cartoons came to be judged not simply as a threat to the civilizational essence of Europe, but also European state security and public order. Legal critics like Andras Sojas insist, for example, that to accept the charge that the Danish cartoons are racist is to ignore the real danger of Islamic terrorism that the cartoons highlight, and I quote, the cartoons indicate a truly unpleasant 
factual connection between terrorism and one very successful version of Islam. If every critical expression becomes suspicious of the danger of generalization, then this will lead to self-censure. If the criticism of religion is successfully recategorized as racism, then that means that you cannot criticize religious terrorism even though religion really does have a finger in the terrorism pie." End of quote. It is striking that in casting the matter as a choice between Islamic terrorism and open debate, Sajo, like many others, portrays the cartoons as statements of facts that are necessary to the security and well-being of liberal democracies. The performative aspect of the Danish cartoons is seeded in favor of their informational content, painting them as little more than referential discourse. Not only does this view naturalize a language ideology in which the primary task of science is the communication of ref referential meaning, in this case, the inherent terrorism of Islam, but it also construes all those who would question such an understanding as religious extremists, or at the very least, as soft multiculturalists who do not fully comprehend the threat posed to liberal democracy by Islam and critics of the cartoons. Furthermore, in so much as the law operationalizes clear and distinct categories, such as religion versus race, religious identity versus racial identity, it leaves little room for understanding ways of being and acting that cut across these distinctions. When concern for state security is coupled with this propensity of positive law, it is not surprising that the Muslim minority recourse to European hate speech laws is judged to be spurious. In conclusion, let me note how far this juridical language of freedom of religion and expression has come from the kind of moral injury I discussed under the concept of skesis. Muslims who want to turn this form of injury into a litigable crime must reckon with the performative character of the law. To subject an injury predicated upon distinctly different conceptions of the subject, religiosity, harm, and semiosis, to the logic of civil law is to promulgate its demise rather than to protect it. Mechanisms of the law are not neutral, but are encoded with an entire set of cultural and epistemological presuppositions that are not indifferent to how religion is practiced and ex experienced in different traditions or within traditions, by different kind of understandings of what it means to, to be a referential subject. Muslims who want to pr preserve an imaginary in which their relation to the Prophet is based on similitude and cohabitation must contend with the transformative power of the law and disciplines of subjectivity on which the law rests. In other words, I'm trying to act, act, what I'm trying to argue here is to challenge this idea that Muslim Euro European Muslims can turn to the language of the law, considering to be a neutral mechanism through which they can seek protections. Because in fact, if you think about the performative character of the law, the very injury that they seek protection for would need to be transformed in order to become legible in the juridical language. In this talk, I've tried to pull apart some of the assumptions that secure the polarization between religious extremism and secular freedom wherein the former is judged to be uncritical, violent, and tyrannical, and the latter tolerant, satirical, and democratic. My attempt is to show that to ascribe to such a description of events is to also simultaneously underwrite a problematic set of notions about religion, perception, language, and perhaps more importantly, in an increasingly litigable world of ours, what law's proper role should be in securing religious freedoms. I hope it is clear from my arguments that the secular liberal principle of freedom of religion or freedom of expression, these are not neutral mechanisms for the negotiation of religious difference and remain quite partial to certain normative conception of religion, subject, law, and injury, language and injury. This is not due to a secular malfeasance in sincerity and inappropriate conception of the secular but a necessary effect that follows from the layers of epistemological, religious, and linguistic commitments built into the matrix of the civil law tradition. Finally, let me close by offering some thoughts on how my analysis here bears upon the exercise of critique, a rubric under which this essay might be located and certainly characterizes what most academic work labors to achieve. It is customary these days to tout critique as an achievement of secular culture and thought. Key to this coupling is the sense that unlike religious belief, critique is predicated upon a necessary distanciation between the subject and object. 
and some form of reasoned deliberation. This understanding of critique is often counterposed to religious reading practices where the subject is understood to be so mired in the object that she cannot achieve the necessary distance necessary to the practice of critique. In a provocative essay, Michael Warner argues that such a conception of critique not only caricatures the religious other, but more importantly remains blind to its disciplines of subjectivity, affective attachments, and subject-object relationality. He tries to track some of the historical transformations in practices of exegesis, contextualization, reading, and codex formation that constitute the backdrop for the emergence of this regnant conception of critique. Warner urges readers to recognize and appreciate the disciplinary labor that goes into the production of a historically peculiar subjectivity entailed in this conception of critique, which is far from universal, but it also needs to be problematized in terms of its relation to the practice of critique. And so much as the tradition of critical theory is infused with the suspicion, if not dismissal, of religion's metaphysical and epistemological commitments, it would behoove us to think critically about this dismissal. How are epistemology and critique related within this, within this tradition? Do distinct traditions of critique require particular epistemology and ontological presuppositions of the subject? How might we rethink the dominant conception of time as empty, homogenous, and bounded, once so germane to our secular conception of history, in light of other ways of relating to and experiencing time that also suffuse modern life? What are some of the practices of self-cultivation, including practices of reading, contemplation, engagement and sociality, internal to secular conceptions of critique. The kind of labor involved in answering these questions requires not only a dialogue across disciplines, but also the putative divide between Western and non-Western traditions of critique and practice. This dialogue, I would submit in turn, depends on making a distinction between the labor entailed in the analysis of phenomenon and defending our own beliefs in certain secular conceptions of liberty and attachment. The tension between the two is a productive one for the exercise of critique, in so much as it suspends the closure necessary to political action, so as to allow thinking to proceed in unaccustomed ways. Such an exercise perhaps should not be so foreign to those who have touted critique as their analytic practice. Perhaps it is too much to ask. Thank you.